Good afternoon. How are you doing? Good? Lovely. Uh, I've got to say, pleasure to, pleasure to be here, guys. A real, real pleasure to be here. Oh, dear. Now, just want me to babble on whilst you yeah, pour the water? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, uh, I feel a bit strange sitting down, actually. But when I'll uh, actually sit down and talk to Shivani uh, when, when we're having that little bit of a discussion. But it's um, something genuinely exciting about coming to Oxford. And it all started... Oh, let me think. I could say probably more than 50 years ago. And uh, my mother decided upon passing her driving test, that's very, very exciting then, there's not, there's a fraction of the cars on the road that there are now, that uh, she'd get herself a Singer Imp. Now, it's a, um, <laughs> it's a very small car, and it's uh, not very, very powerful. But what it did mean, it meant that we suddenly, we could go off and we could travel, we could go around the country, we could go to Brighton, and we could go to Oxford. Ah, the pillar of education. And I remember getting in the back of my mum's car with my brother and sister, me being the youngest, and driving along the... I, it was... We still came through that road. We call it the M40 now, but you still had that... Do you know, as you come from London, you, both sides, it feels like everything's sort of cascading in on you a little bit. Fantastic. It was the most wonderful experience. Then getting to the other side and seeing the sort of rolling hills and the wonderful sunshine coming through. The, it was a sunny day, so it was absolutely perfect. And of course, for the first time in my life, going at over 60 miles an hour. Oh, you know, it was so, so thrilling because cars just really, you know, nobody went very fast in those days. You didn't need to. There was no urgency about, got to get there, got to, you know, hurry, hurry, hurry. It was much, much calmer. And um, arriving in Oxford and being completely amazed at how many bicycles there were here. It's extraordinary, isn't it? You just don't realise it. I'm a Londoner and the air, unless you get caught on the traffic lights, uh, in the middle of the rush hour, do you see many cyclists? But generally, people just puddle up and down. But here, it was fantastic. It was a real enlightening experience. Suddenly, everyone was on the bike, cycling around them. And, of course, all the sort of iconic buildings. And, um, you know, to, to have that and to hold on to that and to think, wow, it was that long ago, but it leaves such an impression on you. I'm sure a lot of you who, you know, at uni, who haven't been here before, but will leave and go away, it will just stay with you because history is a fantastic thing and uh, history combined with education, well, it's perfect, isn't it? It kind of leaves us thinking, yeah, man, I've got something that I'm going to treasure for the rest of my life. So being able to come to Oxford with my late mama um, for the first time and then many years later, I came back and um, I did a meal here. I wonder if it's because you record everything here, don't you? You write everything down. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those kind of institutions where there's always history. And my friend Peter Roberts was the bursar at Balliol College. Do you remember Peter Roberts? Peter's, uh, it was a while ago, you see. I'm talking about sort of maybe no, more than 20 years ago. Anyway, Peter was here. And one of the reasons I was... <laughs> 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 One of the reasons I was, uh, I, I was particularly um, thrilled about coming to uh, Balliol to see my, f my friend Peter and to do a bit of cooking and stuff like that, and everyone sat around the table and they were banging on the tables and stuff. I remember all this stuff going on, it was fantastic. But um, he had the, carpent, uh, the uh, carpet people in at the time, and they were laying new carpet at Balliol College. Well, I had a word with the carpenter, wink, wink, you know, all right, mate, can you sort me out? And, um, God, I haven't spoken about this in such a long time. I told you something would come to light, wouldn't I? I'd won £600 on the premium bonds. Does anybody know what a premium bond is? I've got no fucking idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know what premium bonds are, don't you? Basically, it was the old day, if you didn't do the pools, you, you did premium bonds and you bought a pound for a bond, and then if your number got pulled out, a little bit like the lottery, except the lottery is a, it is a lottery, you really have got no idea, but um, in those days, um, you'd buy them, and you can buy several hundred pounds worth, but if your number came up, and there'd be different categories of how they'd release the cash, I, I won 600 quid, well, 600 quid then, it was, I don't know, many, many thousands of pounds today, and I'd just moved into a, a flat, 
and, um, and I had a word with the uh, carpet guys and they said, yeah, we'd come and th lay the carpet for you. Well, it was £24.99 a square yard. Now, doesn't mean much to you now, but then £24.99, so it was a really good thick carpet. You didn't have to get into bed, I'll tell you. <laughs> it was, everything was on the carpet. It was so soft and so lovely. And everybody had to take their shoes off when they walked into my house and sort of glide on Oh, OK, no, I... You know, do like a little moonwalk, aren't it? <laughs> it was sensational, this carpet. And that was... <laughs> it was... And that was all because of Peter Roberts. Uh, coming to Balliol College, I would not have had that carpet or the wonderful experience that went with that carpet. So that was uh, another ex experience of uh, coming to Oxford. Besides various other times I come and uh, I, uh, you know, just, just like the city. You know, it's got, so I say, just, there's, a, there's a coolness about it. You know, it, it's, it does what it says on the tin or it delivers what it says. If you go there and you want to see the history, it's everywhere. You know, there's this, this wonderful institution of education. It is everywhere. You walk through and you can smell it. And, and everywhere there's pictures for, you know, recognising greatness, recognising how people have contributed. And still today, as you are here, continue to contribute to, to this. It's, uh, it's fantastic. And then, of course, um, oh, I mentioned uh, my mum earlier. And I think, um, really, one of the reasons that I'm at this stage today is because, like a lot of us, because of our, our mothers, um, yeah, daddy too, but my dad was in show business and was constantly away um, performing and doing stuff. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But, the, uh, but my mum was the, um, the person who brought cooking into the home in such a wonderful way. A real, real, it wasn't just fuel, it was a sense of an occasion when it was supper time uh, or, or dinner time, lunch time, call it what you want, there, there, was, there was love that had gone into it. It wasn't just shove it in the oven, take it out, there's your food. There was a lot of love. And, you know, I, 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 I also think my, my father, in a way, contributed. There's me saying he was off working and he perhaps didn't put in. He did put in because he gave her the opportunity which sometimes today is not possible, for her to stay at home. So when we walked into that front door, mum was there from school. She was there. You know, that's not always the case. And because of that, because she was there, and because, you know, she had the time, she had the time to be able to talk about, you know, the food and ting and how this tears good and that tears good and that come from this. And I actually remember saying to my mum, she'd make this amazing food, and I said, what goes into it, Mum? Because I was always a bit about, you know, a bit fastidious about writing things down and sort of how much of this and how much of that goes into it. And all she, all she would uh, ever say is a, a handful of this and a handful of that. You know, you have no idea because all of our hands are different, but it was just... <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah, and I said, how much? A handful. I said, but how much is a handful, Mum? She said, a handful. <laughs> So, and, and it was fantastic though, because it was always about marinating stuff, you know. Um, I, if, if you're part of the whole West Indian scene now, they're obsessed with washing chicken down in lemon. Is there any West Indian here? You, you, do your parents still wash the chicken with lemon and stuff like that, yeah? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you rub the lemon in mancotto di uranis. And they're talking about things being raw. And I could, well, of course it's raw, but of course we are talking about a time in history when you think about food it's food that uh, we didn't have refrigeration that's what you've got to understand when you go back and you start talking about a lot of food and people's culture and why they don't eat meat or they don't eat pork or they don't eat that it's all about years ago we just did not have refrigeration a lot of things were packed in salt so it's the only way of preserving it and drying it out and so hence Akian salt fish the salt fish that goes into a lot of those dishes and of course with the chicken and stuff, when they kill the chicken and it hadn't been chilled down, they squeezed lots of lemon over it. So it had this kind of citrusy flavour to go with it. 
and she always talked about marinating and I became a little bit obsessed in my early days with marinating, soaking stuff, do you know what I mean? Squeezing a little bit on it, you know? What are you, what are you smiling for? What you <laughs> He's a naughty bug in his own game. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, what you like. Anyway, um, <coughs> so that was what my mother was like and she not only did that for me, my brother who's married a couple, he's a granddad now, Chester, um, but he has, uh, you know, married a Persian lady and they had the most wonderful sort of displays of food and stuff and my sister, um, who taught cookery for years and years and years, only recently retired, very, very passionate about it, and still bosses me about. If any of you have got an older brother or sister, you know what it's like. They will still tell you what to fucking do all the time, don't they? They always say, do this, do that. You're not doing that right. You've got to do it this way. What are you doing? And so, you know, but you love it because that's part of it. There's part of you being in the pecking order. You have to accept these things and get on with it and bite your tongue a little bit. But... Um, Hey, uh, it's, it's, it was always lovely, you know, just, as I say, going home and having that love of food and then sort of being able to enhance it and being able to transfer it into my life in a, uh, in a very, very positive way. And things started to happen, things started to unravel. And uh, I'm sure when I start talking to you, you, Sivana, you'll probably be asking me that and how, they, how it all unraveled to get to where I am today. So, uh, so far, so good? Yeah. Okay, let's go to the <laughs> You actually segued me really nicely onto my first question. Yeah. Which was, you spoke about your mother a lot as being an early inspiration and instilling that love of food. Did also growing up in London, a place where cosmopolitan cuisine was prevalent everywhere, kind of inspire that idea of, ooh, this is something that I could get into? And then what also just made you fully commit to a career as a chef in your early days? Yeah, well, uh, you talk about <clears throat> growing up in London now. We are totally spoilt now. Um, because uh, I think London is probably, uh, no, I'd say definitely the eating capital of the world. I've travelled everywhere, and uh, not everywhere, I'm not, but you know, I've travelled to a lot of places, or the places of, of uh, important culinary sort of connections, and for me, London has it all. And one of the reasons is because we're so multicultural there. We embrace every you know, cuisine from globally, from everywhere. It's no problem. You can get if, 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 if Italian or, or any, any cuisine. I'm, I, you know, I could go on and on and on. But growing up, um, so, you know, the, in the 60s and 70s, primary and secondary school, um, for me, there wasn't a lot. You know, food wasn't um, great in this country, guys. It really, really wasn't. It was the... Uh, West End, of course, always had a fabulous reputation for food and the fine hotels. But now um, you can go and cross the road there and get something decent now, you know, because we are all so much more, our, our palates are so much more educated now. And, you know, I, I'm glad to be sort of part of a generation of chefs that changed people's kind of attitude to food. Yeah, I had my, the fun way of introducing it. A lot of people need that. They need the, to fun and to <laughs> lick up with that pepper and sauce is out. Yeah, they, they, they need that kind of thing to happen, to break down all those inhibitions, you know what I mean? Or that they, they get too tight when they cook and what will people think? We always constantly worry about how people are going to think about tasting our food. We all do it. You take something and you think, oh, what are they going to think? What are they going to say? Um, the reality is that, you know, if, you can, if you're having a little bit of fun and you're a little bit more relaxed about it, <clears throat> it comes out in your food. Even when I had chefs in my kitchen, I, I wanted them to be free. I wanted them to sort of just move things. I, I don't want a, a robotic person there. You know, we're not designing something. We're not looking for something that's structured. But look, it's, it's an extension of yourself. And if you're very free and easy with it, the love comes out in the food. and let that, Anyway, that's what my mother taught me, you know. If you're free and everything, it will just come out. The food will just taste good. So you put your heart and soul into it. You're not being tense. If you like this, the food's going to be a little bit like that, you know. It's not about just structuring and, um, you know, putting something on a plate and that goes there, that goes there. It's a, it's a lot more freedom, a lot more relaxedness associated with it. 
And so I think that um, growing up for me meant that uh, I, I, I was really fortunate to, like many people who arrived in Britain in the uh, 50s, 60s, and I get going as far as saying 70s and beyond that, um, but in the early days, um, we wanted to integrate into British society. Britain had this amazing empire, and it was all about, you know, speaking the Queen's English. We all know what television was like in those days, you know, it's all about good evening and welcome to the six o'clock news and all that. It was everybody wanted to sound a certain way, you know. So, uh, we, as, or my parents, like many other people that had come from different parts of the world, wanted to integrate, and that often happened at church. So you joined a religious thing like Church of Anglican, Church of England, if you like, and <clears throat> was that your, necessarily your religious belief? I'm not sure it was, but it brought you into a community. It made you part of the community, and people really wanted to identify with that. They wanted to fit in because already they'd experienced prejudice and racism and everything else. So they wanted to make it an easy path. They didn't want to have that kind of, you know, oh! And, um, it, you know, the great thing is, is that in a way, the, the food connection came that way because my, um, there was uh, Auntie G, uh, the, the Chinese people, G Wong. There was uh, my friend Patab, his Indian family. Scudamores, there was the Greek family. Dino and Vincent San Filippo, there was the Italian family, and I, I, I could go on and on and on. We had all these people that going to church, you get to play with their kids, and then you'd be invited round to their house. You know, I'd be, I was eating these things five, six, seven years old, eating all these different foods. We didn't have pasta. The only pasta you could get spaghetti was this long years ago, and you had to get it and snap it. People didn't know what to do with it. They wouldn't even think about cooking it. No way. And suddenly, I was in the house where the mother was making pasta, you know, and a big mama she was, and, and she was amazing, just cooking and just, you know, loose. And it reminded me of my mum, you know, as soon as you saw someone cooking with a, an easiness in the body, you know, the stir, the taste, just slippers, blah, 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 blah flip, flit, fl or flipping around the kitchen and stuff, a real easiness. Oh, Shivani, it was, it was a joy. And I think from such a young age, that's where I had all those different tastes. Because even now, a lot of us, we go out to eat, oh, I don't like that, oh, that's a bit greasy, oh, that's a bit spicy. Do you know, you can get that type of thing. So you can imagine then being a young man in a country that was very meat and two veg, and even though my mum would cook, Caribbean food. It wasn't every day because, you know, just it was imported and quite often imported in not very good condition. That's why they used to chop a bit off like that and say, oh, you can have that, that bit because that bit was rotten. You wouldn't even think about that now. If anything's rotten in your veg cabinet, you just throw it out. But then you just cut it off and get on with it. So I had that, I had that wonderful um, experience from a very, very, you know, exposure, I should say from a very, very early age, and uh, it just stayed with me. And I, I used to invite all my friends around, you know, um, Paul Hammond, I remember Paul Hammond coming to my house and uh, he was, um, he tasted uh, avocado for the first time. Now, can you imagine if you've never seen an avocado before and someone cuts with a big seed inside, then you've got that kind of greeny, kind of creamy flesh. It just, it, it was bizarre. If you'd never seen anything like that before, how on earth do you eat it? What do, you, what, what do I do, you know? And he tasted it and he said, it's the best thing he'd ever tasted. My mum just put a little, squeeze a little lemon juice on it, a little touch of salt and pepper, you know? And it was just like, wow. He'd never experienced anything like that in his life. And that's, that's what it was all about. It was, that's what I grew up with. I grew up with all the time thinking, I want to give people new experiences. You know, I used to cook and invite my mates over. Any footy was on, it was always around my house, you know, doing a little bit of a barbecue or having a bit of a brunch or something like that. Loved all that. Did you kind of feel then that organic, almost musical, rhythmic way of cooking was sometimes undermined when you actually went into a professional kitchen, when you started out as a chef, as a oh career? Oh, God, yeah. And how did you kind of come to terms with that or try to sort of impose your own style in well, that Well, I think, you know, when you start talking about... Um, going into uh, a world which was pretty structured and um, you know there was a certain amount of discipline no messing about no doing this no doing that it was uh, 
and I, I was training in kitchens like that, you know, from the age of 17. And I started off, I went to France one year to um, stay with uh, my friend Charles with a girlfriend called Pascal. I know it's a bit sort of, <laughs> but she was, we used to do these exchange things. So they'd, the student would come here, then you'd go back and visit. And it so happened he was going to go over to an uh, island called Ile de Ré, near La Rochelle. And in those days, you had to take the ferry across. I think there's a bridge that takes you there now. And I remember going with Charles and Pascal. We went to, and stayed with her parents in a beautiful home, really, really lovely. And um, he was obviously sort of quite busy with Pascal. So I'd hang out in the kitchen with his mum, and we'd go to sometimes go to the market. I'd do a bit of fishing with his dad, or we'd go. It, it was like, it was a whole new world that I'd never experienced before because there was, it was the abundance of ingredients. It was how much volume there were in these markets down the middle of, you know, middle of France at the time. And it was just fantastic. And I just thought, wow. And I learned all this cooking. And, and, um, and more importantly, I think more than the cooking, I learned the secret of dining, of sitting down for hours. We, do you know, if you think about most of us now, we eat and we're in a hurry, aren't we? We're eating and then we're on the go. Then um, to suddenly sit down at, whether it be noon or one o'clock, and not get up till four or five, it was just a very slow process of eating and how much you, how much you can enjoy food if you give it time. If you just invite friends and a little bit, it's no hurry, it's no rush. You know, we seem to gollop it down, drink whatever's down, and then you're on the go again. And if you kind of just slow it down a little bit, you know, oh man. It, uh, so I think that, uh, yes, there was a bit of a, there was a bit of like, who's this bloke? Who's, who is he? You know, um, you know I, I used to get the thing, he's not a chef. He's not a chef, he's not this, that, he's a, you know, he's a showman. Um, and I think a part, of, part of that was true, that I was a showman because my mother, being the incredible cook that she was, and my father, having got um, a scholarship to the Royal College of Music here from Jamaica, I think they, guys, I think they only gave out about three a year or something like that, to have that, that kind of invitation from Britain, you know, to come and study here was fantastic. And he'd been playing the organ since he was nine years old all around the island of Jamaica. And um, beautiful pianist, classic jazz, everything. And um, came over here and, uh, you know, and, and found himself eventually in the entertainment business because he needs to survive. And it doesn't matter what degree you've got unless you can find a way to utilize it and use it. It's not gonna happen. So it was um, for him to be able to go off and to suddenly work getting a gig at the Cafe Royal or Quaglino's, you know, one of those type of, you know, uh, classic institutions of entertainment, if you like, um, was fantastic. And so I had that, I had that growing up, you know, um, and people don't, you know, I've spoken about this before, sitting in my front room at home and we had this big Bluthner piano, grand piano. And most of the time it was open. And, um, and I'd sit underneath and I'd see my dad's friends and there's people like the, uh, come on in, someone there. <laughs> oh, it's you up the top there, is it? Yeah, hello. Um, and <laughs> it was, uh, it was, um, there was people like, I don't know, Bruce Forsyth, Bob Munkhouse, people sitting in my living room at home like that. And I'm only naming people that you know, but everyone was in show business together, Shivani. It was almost like, you know, you're all students together, doesn't matter what, what level you're at. You know, in show business, some people have been enormously successful, but they're still in show business. They all still might meet, you might do, you know, a big show on TV one week, and then you're back doing your gig in Blackpool. At the, at the Winter Gardens or something like that. So they all knew one another. And there I was as a young child observing my dad and his mates chatting, laughing and joking. My mum bringing in all these delicious nibbles to try and stuff like that. Even then, then she was doing that. And there's me looking at that. You know, it's a, it's a combination of the two, the food and the entertainment. So I was never 
frightened to express myself in that way, to have a little bit of a dance around the kitchen and stuff like that, you know, because it was, uh, it was just a, a natural thing to do. And so I didn't mind that criticism because regardless of what they say, oh, he's always, um, he's so, uh, uh, one what, 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 what thing, they actually wrote this in a paper that I, I took a line of cocaine before I did every show. Can you imagine? <laughs> I did nearly 2,000 shows of Ready, Steady, Cook. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> what? You know. And also, I've got a bent septum from playing rugby, so I could never do that anyway, because I've, I've got half the bones missing in me bloody nose, you know. Anyway, um, so uh, I can understand the, uh, the backlash. And there was, I know, Rusty... The brilliant Rusty Lee had been doing things on TV before, but there was a, a no, there had never been a black chef that had come come along, and I think there was restrictions. Certainly, there was a little bit of a restriction in terms of um, uh, what you were allowed to do and how you were able to express yourself. Even in my books in the early days, it was all about my editor always used to say, about, "Oh, it's about fun cooking, about fun cooking." I could never be too serious, even though I was classically trained in a French cuisine kitchen. I could never really nail down and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that in a classic way. It always had to be a fun way, um, <clears throat> which worked. I'm not, you know, I can't knock it, but there's times when I think it could, have, could have quite easily have thought, I could have gone in that direction or that direction, but you seem to be sort of pushed over there, you know, kind of shoved in that corner. And, you know, there was, there was tough times. I used to go for jobs in the West End and because of my colour, I didn't get the gig. You know, and um, it was, it's just what happened. It was just the way it kind of was at the time and it angered you, but it was nothing compared to what my parents had probably experienced. And um, I'm now, I've laid the foundation for my children, the next generation. So each time we've, we've stepped, we've taken a big step forward, you know, kept saying, no, this is not right. This is the way it should be done. I've never seen so many black people in commercials in my life at the moment, you know. Whereas before it was just the odd one there. And it's fantastic, it kind of lifts your spirits because it should be normal. I shouldn't see it as, oh, look. You know, we, as kids growing up, we would wait for someone like Earl Cameron, who was a black movie star at the time, to pop up on, our, on, on a film. And the whole place, my sister would scream, Sam, there's a black person on the TV! We'd all, all run down, just have a look, you know. Um, and it's, it's so normal now. And, uh, you know, thank, thank God. Yeah. So you then kind of feel that the marriage of entertainment and cooking has been a good way to propel cooking in the home into the mainstream. Oh, God. But yeah. I think probably now, maybe more than ever, things like delivery, takeaways, a lot of people, I think, have fallen out of love or perhaps don't have the time to cook a home-cooked meal at the end of the day. What do you think can be done to kind of reinvigorate that spirit again? Well, I think it's, I think it's inevitable that... Um, with the way that life has gone, the life has changed. You know, there was, I talked about my mother being at home and stuff like that. There was very much a mother thing about being at home, doing the cooking and stuff like that. That's all changed. I ain't gonna come back. So let's not sort of try and think that we're gonna invent some fancy way of, of, of turning it around. We live in the world that we live in now. And hopefully what will come out of it is that you'll suddenly realize when I go on holiday, I just want to cook, I want to go to the market, I want to buy my lovely food, and that's the time you slow down. And I think it's kind of something quite natural too about having a family that might do that. And whether you can make that decision or not, depending on your income, depending on where you live, all those things contribute to it. Um, having the fun side of things, um, oh, I think the, the fun side is, as I've pointed out before, is the, the relaxed way of doing it. Don't get too worked up, it's a meal and you're probably going to have another one in three or four hours time and then in the morning, then again, you know, it's a meal so we shouldn't get too worked up about it. I do understand that people get a little bit flustered when it comes to di dinner parties and stuff like that, but that's okay. That's okay being flustered. You get flustered when you have to write something down on your, uh, an essay or something like that, don't you? You know, you have to give something in. We all get a little bit flustered. We all get a little bit like, <gasps> like that. That's, that's okay, because next time you do it, you're going to feel a little bit more relaxed. And eventually, you're just going to get to the stage where you can actually look at that paper and read it instead of trying to think about another person reading it. You read it and you enjoy it. And that's what happens with food. You suddenly, you know, it's, 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 it's that feeling. 
What's that great Maya Angelou saying? People forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget the way you make them feel. And it is, it's all about how that resonates with you. What is it? What did they do? I can't remember. What, what did he make? I can't remember. Well, I feel fantastic. And sometimes music does that to you. It just takes you to a place where you don't, perhaps you don't even know the words, you just know the melody. It just makes you, it could quite easily be uh, a, you know, an instrumental piece. It just makes you feel great. And there's nothing wrong in that. Um, food is changing. My daughter is actually the uh, um, PA to the uh, president of, um, vice president and president of Deliveroo. So I know quite much about this and there's been a phenomenal growth in that business. I think what, in, within a couple of years, 400% growth or something in the food delivery business, not just Deliveroo, Hungry Horse, um, Uber Eats, uh, you know, uh, Just Eats. There's, there's, there's quite a few of them now and there are more that are going to start up because it's a, it's a big business and it gives us an opportunity to eat what we want when we want to eat it. Uh, <clears throat> those that do want to cook will always cook. I think those people who do have a passion for it and like it because they find it easy and quite relaxing. Those that don't will always find an excuse that either, you know, it just means that the excuse now, there's greater choice to go with the excuse. You know, um, it's... Uh, is there going to be a resurgence of people cooking at home? I can't see it. I can't, I, I can't see the... I can see people uh, perhaps... Um, you know, they have to spend so much money on kitchens and everything else, and yet we end up going out more. You know, we all have these elaborate kitchens at home, and yet, you know, you think, oh... But um, they, 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 they probably do eat in and when they do eat in it's the quality of food they eat in instead of heating up so instead of just heating up and having casual not everybody can afford it we are talking about here the top echelon here right um you know i've done programs where i've gone and you get you know five pounds to feed the family uh, for the for, uh, for, for 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 the meal and yet um you think you're going to struggle with that you don't necessarily have to struggle it's how you know how you cook and how much time you have an effort to put put into it you know uh you know that um, what's that great thing about someone from, and this is what you do and you wrap it up and you stuff it with this and then and you pop it in your oven and the woman was on the end of the phone she said i haven't got an oven <laughs> so that is that is what that's the reality is you see we forget we just assume that everyone's got the basic standard bits and pieces sometimes it's not like that so it's beginning to change in terms of how we eat, but more importantly, I think we are more, so much more aware of what we eat now. And we like to know where our food comes from. You know, isn't it, uh, isn't it sort of uh, weird that, you know, years ago, um, we, we all used to talk about New Zealand lamb. That's the furthest fucking place, the other side of the world. <laughs> And now we want to know it, it's just come from, come from it's Oxfordshire land. That's what you want to know, you know. You don't want to know that it's come from the other side of the world. But yet, New Zealand lamb was a big, big thing when I was growing up. And they used to show all this wonderful countryside. Well, and it's still loads of countryside. No one lives there, really, do they? I mean, any New Zealanders in? Anybody from New Zealand? There you go. How big is your country? <laughs> it's enormous, but no one's there. You know what I'm talking about. So it's... <laughs> Everyone leaves! Every, is it half, half, half the people go? Yeah, 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 more sheep than people, you know that. But it's uh, still very beautiful though, <gasps> the beaches. I remember going to, um, walking on the, some of your beaches. Oh, <gasps> just the most amazing thing. But then these things came out and bit my legs. What's, what's those big spiders that you've got things there? <laughs> is it? I don't know what they were, white snips, black snips. They snipped for sure, that's what they did. <laughs> Fant oh, amazing, 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 amazing. So I uh, know we've had uh, we've, we've had some uh, I've had some interesting experiences yeah. there. Let's see. <laughs> okay, I think final question for me before I open it out to the audience. Um, obviously, Ready Steady Cook made you a household name, but over the last few years, there's been a bit of a meme <laughs> legacy around you. <laughs> um, what were your thoughts when you first heard about Ooh, this? We like a bit of that, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> What's he like? Oh yes, oh lovely. Wow. 
Do you know what? Um, <laughs> um, I've got to say that the whole meme thing, isn't it amazing? I mean, all you guys are responsible for it, but <laughs> unbelievable. Sometimes I go out to do, and there'll be 50 people lined up with Ainsley Harriet t-shirts going like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I can't believe it. I got Glastonbury, there's a Glastonbury fag raising <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere I go, there's these things going on. Uh, what, can, uh, um, what can I say about it? Well, I think that... Um, I, I, uh, I remember talking to my daughter Maddie about it, because uh, Maddie is, what, um, 24 now, uh, Moo Pops, and she... Um, and I, yeah, Moo Pops. I sing at the Regis School, Maddie Moo Pops. Um, there used to be something called uh, Top Cat. Do you remember Top Cat? I used to say, Moo Pops, the most original Moo Pops, the most original, prettiest girl that I've ever seen, the one that means so much to me, Moo Pops, the most original Moody, Moody Pops, she's the top, she's the pop, she's the number one girl, oh, Moo Pops, Moo Pops. <laughs> And I, 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 I used to sing the, you know, she'd come home from school, say, sing the Moo Pop song, Daddy, sing the Moo Pop song. Anyway, my Moo, um, she uh, started to tell me all about these meme things, and it's, it's been incredible. You know, um, the, uh, sometimes my agent turns around to me, she'll be charging. I said, what are you going to charge? Who are you going to charge? People are just having a good time. What about the T-shirt? Like the T-shirt, people are having a good time. And I'm a bit like that sometimes, just, you know, in life, Sometimes things come back to you in a different way. You know, it's not all about grab, 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 take, 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 take. It's just to let it breathe. Some, you know, people are getting excitement from it, the joy of it. Um, you know, I also have a, another son called Joe, who's what, Joe's 14 now, nearly 15. And uh, can you imagine what's happening at, when, when he gets at school? <laughs> Is you've seen your dad? <laughs> 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 oh, prick, prick with a fork. Oh, I don't know. They're, they're all, is it like that, that fork with a prick, isn't it? Or something like that. Something, with a sausage. I just kind of think, what is going on? But um, I think you... Uh, I, I don't feel bad about it. I feel quite overjoyed that, you know, um, I'm a guy now and I'm 61 and I still feel... I get up in the morning, I go and do my Pilates, I walk with Mongoose, my dog, <laughs> and... Um, and I, uh, I do my you know, Pilates, I, do, I play tennis, I, I try and just to go, go on. And so I, st I still feel very active, I still feel very alive within myself. And, um, and to know that people out there are getting a buzz and getting a kick off that, that, that gives me a buzz in a way. It makes me think, yeah, you know, someone's smiling with it. It's not like they're coming up and going, ooh, like that. It's, it's, it's not like that at all, you know. It's a, it's a very kind of positive uh, image, in a way, and a, 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 a positive feedback. Well, you know, what I'm getting from you guys. Positive, lovely, thank you. Really good. Okay, good. Thank you so much. I'll yeah. now open up to questions from the audience. If you just wait, and a mic will be passed to you. And if you could stand up when you say your question. So, yes, remember in the second row. Yes, in my you passed her. Hi, um, I'm Kayla. Uh, you're a really big childhood hero of mine. Actually, when I was 11, I was undergoing um, treatment for cancer and discovered Ready, Steady, Cook at a time when chemo was destroying my taste buds and, you know, steroids made me very hungry. So um, I kind of found cooking through your show and um, changed my life. So thank you. I wanted to like oh, give you a personal thank you because it means a lot to me. Um, so I was wondering if you could help my taste buds one more time. Um, and I'm trying to get into cooking fish now more. It's, it's kind of new for me. Um, so, you know, you've spoken a lot about um, the Caribbean influences um, that you were brought up with, and I was wondering if you could recommend some dishes for me, um, or one, maybe, one dish. A fish dish. A fish dish fish with dish. some flavor, dish. with some good flavor. Fish, fish, <laughs> dish, dish. <laughs> um, do you know what? I, I, I think still, uh, 
<laughs> we can get some of my couscous and sprinkle on the fish, which gives it a lovely, crunchy sort of... I'm, I'm being really serious here now, especially the tomato and chilli one. And you sprinkle that on it and pack it into the fish and it gives it that lovely, crispy coat so you don't need the breadcrumbs, you don't need that heavy kind of gluten thing going on. Um, but fish is probably... Um, they call it... Uh, I, I, well, I certainly refer to it. It's one of the greatest fast foods going. It doesn't take very long to cook at all. You know, my um, fish and the oven, I think, work in perfect harmony. The, the au four, as my old friend, uh, French chef, uh, Ron Genot, would say to me, perfection, you know, baking your fish in the oven, not for long. I mean, if it's got, you know, 10, 12 minutes, don't, don't overdo it. It's got a lovely succulence to it, fish. It should be pearlesque. And if you allow it to go over and that, the juices come out, like a breast of chicken too. I know it's, you, you're piscatarian now and you know, you're not go, you've gone away from that. My son was vegan a month ago, then he smelt one, smelt one of my chicken dishes. I've got to have some of that, Dad, I've got to have some of that. <laughs> <laughs> so it depends who's cooking for you, right? But um, yeah, fish is, uh, you know, I, I love cooking it too. I, like, I kind of like the, and the, the little sort of salty paprika connection, the sort of chorizo connection that goes with it, the red pepper, that, that type of sweet and sort of sour, slightly bitter taste that complements it. But again, it very much depends on the fish that you're, you're, you're cooking because, you know, um, it's such a, it's such, it's such, so gentle, so subtle, quite honestly, unless you go for something like a turbot, do you know what I mean? Or something, a turbot is very expensive, it's a strong fish, but it's one of the reasons that we tend to go for something like a sea bass in the kitchen. It's unforgiving, it goes well with flavours, you can hit it with anything, you can do what you want with it. Um, I think Asian spices go particularly well with it. You know, you talked about the Caribbean, there could be a little bit of jerk kind of mix going on there, but for me, again, cuts through, kills everything a little bit. Asian, sometimes, as long as you reduce the chilli, it can be a real, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's just a bit more, it's a bit more refreshing in the mouth, I think, so especially some of those kind of Thai things. I mean, I could, I could write you out a recipe, but pop online, go online, what you fancy, type it in and go for it, you know? Um, there, there is so, so much choice there, instead of just me sort of writing out a recipe. It depends what you've got to complement it, what you've got in your cupboard. And there's some fantastic websites now that you type in the ingredients that you've got and they're going to come up. Well, I still, have, I still have my original Ready Steady cookbook, so oh, I can always I go back isn't to Isn't it that. great? It's me, yeah, and the, the late Ross Burden, my friend, who was, uh, they called him License to Grill. He did look like he did. He, was a, he had this wonderful black hair, New Zealander guy, so good looking. Um, and uh, loved it, and all the women loved him. And he was the... Uh, if, for the next person to marry, he was as camp and as gay as anything, you know. But everyone thought he was going to be the next person to marry, although everybody thought, he's going to be perfect for me, you know. And but um, going round to his... Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ross was perfect. He lived, he lived this wonderful life whereby uh, he just... Everything was just OK. And there was a wonderful moment when, um, three days previously, I'd been round at his flat near Shepherd's Bush, and, uh, and uh, we had a, a nice evening, and then he invited us back at the weekend. It was um, on the uh, Saturday or something. Oh, come over for dinner. Come over, all my friends are coming. And I went there, and of course, all the, I walked in there, everything was different. All the furniture was different. The dining room table were different. Everything was different. And I said, Ross, I said, is this a different flat? He said, no, the bailiffs have been, darling. <laughs> he said, I was on eBay this morning and I've replaced everything. <laughs> so it was that quick, is that one minute they come and they took everything away. And then he, you just go on eBay and he bought the table, he bought the cup, he bought everything, bang. As if nothing had happened. That's what living is all about, isn't it? Spontaneity, oh, that's gone, let's move on. Thank you for your question. Now, who, who was next? Okay, can we go to the member of the orange shirt? Hi Ainsley, if you were to come to Oxford to study, what could you envisage yourself studying? Oh, what was that? If you could come to Oxford to study, what would you <laughs> <laughs> That was That was a bit fast. <laughs> if I could come to Oxford for studying, what would I study? Um, <clears throat> oh, now. I think you have to look back at what you, uh, academia, 
was necessarily my forty at school. I tried really, really hard, you know. But I think that uh, my sister, who went on to uni, I think got the best of it. I think mum was at home and, you know, sort of reading and to her and stuff like that, giving her the time of day. Um, <coughs> my brother a little bit, but me being the youngest, I, uh, by the time I started to grow up, I think the uh, uh, mum started working a bit and she went back and uh, studied accounting and got a job because she wanted to be independent. She didn't want to rely on my dad giving her money for school clothes or school or stuff. She wanted to be an independent woman, which was something that uh, I think really made my sister a much, much stronger woman too in her, in her later years but with regards to teaching and you know, her passion. But, um, oh, uh, I've, I, so I think what happens is cooking kind of worked. I wouldn't say I was that thick, actually. When I think back at it, I remember Mr. Mitchum saying to me at school when I went to tell him that I didn't want to... Because um, I'd been to La Rochelle and I wanted to go into the kitchen uh, to cook. He said, you're far too bright for that, Harriet. There was a kind of a, a dismissiveness, uh, which you perhaps wouldn't get today, but then it was all about, you're going to go and work in a kitchen, you've got to... You know, it's almost like being a football apprentice, then you had to clean the boots when you were younger, and in those days you had to clean the ovens and you had to take a, a solution, because it was all these beautiful copper pots and pans and stuff, and you used to have to mix this salt, flour, and vinegar together to make this paste, and that would buff up all these copper pans and stuff like that. So, um, so well, the reason I'm mentioning that is because I think that... Uh, you have to look at what your real hobbies were, what your passions were, things that excited you. And I'm a bit of a, <laughs> which is sad to say, I'm a bit of an encyclopedia when it comes to tennis, because I grew up with a brother who was obsessed with it, and I can go back as far as you like to, you know, to the great Rod Lavers and people like that, who's a f phenomenal um, a a Australian tennis player and... Uh, Lou Hode and, um, oh dear, Tony Roach. And, and anyway, um, I'm digressing here a little bit, but <coughs> what I'm basically saying is that's where my passion was. And I love, even today, uh, tennis is, you know, my favourite sport to play. And I still think I would have loved to have been a professional tennis player. So maybe, is it a case of coming here and studying sport? I don't know if it would give me that opportunity because I don't know if it's all about the activity. I think it's about the sort of learning of it. And um, I think it was, and I think I'd be, I'd probably be a little bit embarrassed if I went on Mastermind and started talking about tennis <laughs> from the 1950s to the 1980s or something. Do you know what I mean? It's not enough. I think when you've got a, 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 a great institution like this, I think you'd want to take something which was... Um, something that which was really of great value to life, that really kind of made you feel that, you know, that, that you, you've gained something, you've learned something, whether it be something that you're going to use as a job, that, that, that's not the important issue, it's what it gives you. And I think that it, you really need to, to have that and you to kind of think, this is what, it's enriched my life, it's given me something here, and no one could ever take that away from me. Um, as so often happens, you know, my, my son Jimmy at home has got several of his friends, Edward, Dom, you know, all of them come around, left uni first class degrees and they're working with their uncles selling tickets for events and stuff like that, you know, and they're 27 years old. So, you know, and when I talk with them, they always say, yeah, oh, man, well, you know, I had a fantastic time. Never forget those things. And that's what you've got to take with it. Um, but I'm looking, looking at it as a way of, what work would it bring? What, that's what I'd like to do because I'd like to do that job. And it doesn't necessarily sort of, you know, oh dear, I'm going a bit round the edge here, I'm trying to think. <laughs> <sighs> what would it be? Um, I think as I get older, um, politics mean a lot more to me than they've, uh, than they've ever done before, yeah. Um, than it's ever done before, you know, because news is at our fingertips now, isn't it? There's just so much information coming to you. It's just uh, incredible, yeah? <coughs> Which reminds me of that joke about Donald Trump. Did you hear the joke about Donald Trump? 
Do you want to hear the joke about Donald Trump? <laughs> Is that a unanimous yes? Yes? yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So Donald Trump has a heart attack and dies and goes down to hell. <laughs> and uh, when he arrives down there, the devil says, oh, yeah. hello, Mr. President. He says, oh, hello. He says, uh, he said, we've been expecting you. He says, oh, have you? He says, yes. He says, I've got a bit of bad news. He said, what's that? He says, um, we've got no room down here. We're a bit busy. He said, well, that's not very good. He said, well, I'll tell you what, though, Mr. President. He says, um, he said, what we'll do is we'll take you to three different rooms. And he says, and whatever room you decide to choose, he said, we'll throw that person out and you can go in there. So he goes, that sounds satisfactory. He goes, all right, then. So he takes him down and he opens up the first door and behind the first door, on a little platform, is Richard Nixon. And there's a little pool of water and he jumps into the pool of water, swims around, gets out, and he does the same thing again and again and again. That's his punishment for being in hell. And Trump turns to the devil, he says, I'm not a very good swimmer. He says, I don't think I can go into this room. He said, no problem at all, Mr. President. Takes him to the next room. And as he opens the door, there's Tony Blair with a pickaxe hacking away. <laughs> at this rock, like this, bash, bash, bashing away. And that's his punishment, obviously, for being in hell. And um, he said, I got a bit of a bad shoulder. He says, I don't think I can do this job. He says, no problem at all, Mr. President. So he takes him into the final room, and there, in the final room, is, um, uh, what's his name? The, uh, it's coming to me, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah, he's, um, <laughs> I can't why, 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 why it's not there. <laughs> Don't worry, it will come to me. Is Clinton. What's his first name? Bill. Bill. <laughs> Bill Clinton is laying there, stark naked, like that, laying back, you see. Just lying back there, like there. And um, very appropriately positioned is Monica Lewinsky. So the president looks at this, and then he looks at the devil, he says, I think I can go into this room. And the devil turns around and says, Monica, you're free to go. <laughs> and on that then. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do think that we have run out of time, but I'd like to thank you, Inti oh, for such really? a oh lively and warm yeah. address. Can we all join me in thanking Inti